So I wanted to tell you about the life of a very unusual saint of God, Vitali, or Vitalis of Gaza. Uh, he was a monk in his 50s, almost 60 years old, near 60, and uh, he had ded dedicated his life to God. He had become a monastic. He had lived in asceticism. He had perfected his soul in the fear of God. And then after all that, God gave him a very unusual uh, assignment. He got a little dwelling in, this, in, the, in the city. It was Alexandria. And he would work all day long as a day laborer. He'd get paid at the end of the day. They always paid you the same day in those days. Um, the paycheck was always at the end of the day. And then he would take that money that he had just been paid and he would go to the whorehouse, the brothel. And he would tell them that he wanted a girl for the night. And they would put him in a room and they would, he would ask for one, you know, sometimes a, a particular girl and they would uh, put her into the room with him for the night. And then when, when the prostitute would come in the room, he would tell her, my dear, I'm not here to defile you or myself. I'm here so that you can get a good night's sleep and so that you won't have to defile yourself at least this one night that I'm here. And so, my dear, you just go lay down on this bed over here and, and get some sleep. You look like you need some sleep. And I'll go into this corner and I'll pray for your soul all night long until the morning. No, I won't allow anyone else in the room. But he started doing this and, uh, and the young ladies started leaving the, the brothel. They started, some became nuns, some became married, some, some uh, obtained honest work. One by one, they were leaving because of his influence. But he, he made each of them swear very strictly that they would not tell a soul what, what he was doing. Because then, of course, they wouldn't let him in the house and he wouldn't be able to do his work for God. And um, very strictly. And he warned them that very bad things will happen to them. They will be cursed if they tell anyone what he's doing. And they all promised, they all swore. So he was saving many uh, of the souls of these women. Meanwhile, the Christians in the city in Alexandria were very upset. So uh, they were furious that the good name of the Christians was being ruined by this monk going to the whorehouse all the time. And they confronted him and they denounced him. They tried to make him give up what he was doing. You know, uh, we understand that you have a problem. Uh, you know, come clean, renounce this, you know, stop doing this. And um, he said, no, I cannot stop. And then they said, well, at least don't wear your monk's habit into the whorehouse. It's bringing shame upon the whole church. Take off your habit. He said, I cannot do that. So the Christians were very, very upset. They also uh, denounced him to uh, St. John, who was the patriarch of Alexandria at that time, um, the almsgiver. I believe it was St. John, the almsgiver. And <clears throat> so they came to him. They said, you know, tell this monk, or you're the patriarch. Tell this monk to stop doing this. He's doing all the, you know, he's, he keeps going and... Uh, Spending the night in the... St. John heard this and he says, I, I, I just can't believe it. I just can't believe that he's doing these things. He said, denounce it. He says, I can't. I, 
Yeah, I, I just can't believe. I just can't believe it. So the Christians were very, very angry and they were uh, very upset. Meanwhile, he kept going uh, back night by night. Many uh, women were being saved um, and turning to Christ. But here's how it ended. Uh, one morning, he, uh, usual, as usual, had, had finished his night of prayer uh, with a girl. And uh, he was coming out the back door of the uh, establishment in the early morning hours. The sun was just coming up. And one of the Christians, a young man, was uh, coming by on the street, saw him. Sure, the one. He went over to him and just punched him and beat him and uh, injured him. So, uh, you know, that'll serve you right. Uh, bringing shame upon the church. And, and uh, Vitaly was injured. He went back to his little hut. He wrote out some things on a piece of paper. And, uh, oh, there's something else I forgot. I'm ahead of myself. There was one of, one of the young ladies that he had turned away from a life of sin um, when she kept hearing him slandered by the, by the people, by Christians, she, um, she just couldn't stand to hear it. So she's tried to defend him. Of course, she had promised not to do this. And the moment she tried to say, state his innocence, then she became possessed by a demon. She was no longer, you know, uh, normal. It was obvious to everybody. So, and of course, what she said was not believed. But, um, so now she's possessed by a demon. Well, anyway, back to our young man. I, I, I forget how it, how it happened that he wanted to um, apologize to Vitali. And uh, maybe he had received a vision or someone had told him something, or I forget what it was. He heard that he was injured uh, severely. And... Uh, so he found out where he lived, and he went to ask his forgiveness. And when he told people what he was doing, they were going to ask his forgiveness? Why ask his forgiveness? And what's that going to be like? And he's going to that guy that goes to the whorehouse. And so a, a crowd of people started following him. At the same time, the demoniac woman, uh, she also was making her way to his little hut. Well, they, they all arrived at the hut, and... Uh, they knock on the door, no answer. Somebody said, oh, he's in there. I saw him go in there. Knock on the door, no answer. Finally, they opened the door and uh, they found that St. Vitali had died of his injuries. The explanation of what he had been doing was it was written by him. Also, it was corroborated uh, when the demoniac woman came up and, uh, you know, at, at first of all, acting crazy and howling and stuff, shrieking, and then she came up and she, she just touched his feet and begged his prayers. And then she was instantly healed of the demon. And now that he was dead, she told everybody freely uh, what he had been doing to save people. And soon everybody realized he was a saint. And the young man was weeping and distraught that he had, I, I, I killed a saint. He repented of his deeds. And if I remember rightly, he became a monk. So we remember St. Vitali on April 11th every year. And his story does teach us that we Dare not judge our neighbor. Even if we see what, what seems to be pretty obviously um, sins being committed, we can't judge our, our neighbor's soul. Another example, it's, it's, it's rather an extreme example. Uh, hear me out, hear me out. There was a young man in Athens uh, decades ago, decades ago. He was tormented by lustful thoughts. It was all he could think about. 
there were acts of impurity. He just couldn't think of anything else. He was just, he was basically sex obsessed. He went to the priest to go to confession. He went to a very wise priest. And uh, here's what the priest told him. So you don't have any shame before God's face to, do, to, do, to think these thoughts or do these deeds. He says, so I'm going to, here's your penance. I want you to take such and such a, it was a bus, a, a tram, a trolley, whatever it was in those days. I think it was like the first part of the 20th century, but maybe it was a little bit, maybe it was the middle of that century. Anyway, there's a line, there's a, trans, there's a public transport. He says, I want you to take this public transport to this intersection. That's where the connection is with that other transport. Then you get on the other transport and you're going to take it to this intersection. Then you're going to get off, go right into the middle, very big intersection, lots of traffic. He says, and take all of your clothes off right there in the middle of the intersection. Since you have no shame before God, I'll teach you some shame. And that is your penance. Do you accept it? Yes, Father. So the young man got on the, whatever it was, bus, train, whatever it was. Of course, what do you think is going through his mind? <laughs> he gets to the intersection, but the priest had sent a deacon to, or somebody to, to meet him at that very intersection before he could get on the other train, telling him, Father, Father sent me to tell you, you don't have to do it. <laughs> He missed him, right? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to do it. It's like it's like Abraham was supposed to sacrifice his son Isaac, but then, you know, he was told at the last minute, Oh, you don't have to do it. You're willing to, so it counts. That counts for the for the for the for the faithfulness. But the young man was completely set free from this sin. He was completely delivered from this passion. Well, so the deacon did stop him. The deacon, of course. Oh, I thought maybe they missed each other somehow. Yeah. So, um, so was it wrong for the priest to tell the young man to go take off all his clothes on a busy street corner? In this case, it saved his soul. There's some things that are always wrong. There's some things that are sometimes wrong, sometimes right, depending on the circumstance. Maybe even almost always wrong. And then there are things that are always right. But some of those we have to look out for also. Is it right to, to keep the fasts of the church? Well, what about if your attitude is such that in the very keeping of these fasts, you judge everyone, condemn everyone else and think that you're the best? Wouldn't it be better just not to even fast at all? So blessed Theophilus, uh, Theophil of Kiev. When was he? The 1840s, 1850s, 1840s. One time he uh, was seen going through the streets of Kiev. The blessed fool. And he, uh, it was right in the middle of Lent. And he was eating meat in front of everybody. Eating meat, eating meat, eating meat, eating a piece of beef or something. That was. And everyone was horrified. And they were gathering around like, what are you doing? What, is this? what does this mean? And he said, citizens of Kiev, you are eating the flesh of your brothers by slander, by judgment, by harsh deeds and words. You are doing something far worse than I am doing, eating this meat. Compared to what you're doing, eating this meat is no sin at all. Compared to what you're doing. And he brought the people to repentance. They, would, they wept for their sins. So is it wrong to eat meat in Lent? Well, ordinarily...
but God is who sees all the motives of the action, all the, the reasons why we do everything. So there are some things that are always wrong. There are some things that are always right. But there are many things in, this, in the center category. We have to be so careful uh, not to judge. So let me give you another example of something that seems so obvious. A lady confessed to a crime. Uh, this was only about, I think it was about 10 years ago now, in Germany. See, there was an unsolved murder from World War II. I think it was 1943, 42 or 43, I forget. There was a young lady. She was a, an activist. She was an anti-Hitler, an anti-Nazi activist. She was part of an underground movement. And she found out where a Nazi officer was living. This Nazi officer was in charge of uh, doing things like um, sending, rounding up Jews and sending them to concentration camps. She found out where he lived. She found out the address. She put a pistol in her purse. She went to his house. She knew his schedule. She knew that he was going to be there. She knocked on the door. He answered the door and she pulled out her gun and she shot him point blank range. And then she ran off. The murder was never solved until just some years ago. She was in her nineties. And she figured she would confess. She told the media about it. She confessed publicly. You see, here's the, here's, here's, here's the reason. Here's, here's, here's what I want to tell you. After she killed him, she found out, actually, this man was using his position as a Nazi officer to save Jews' lives. He was saving them by the, by the scores, by the hundreds. He was saving lives, using his high position. And no one knew about this. It came out after his death. She killed the wrong man. But wouldn't that seem so obvious? So obvious. Obviously a good thing to do. Uh, here's another example. So... 19th century Russia, I think it was Optina, but I'm not quite sure of the monastery, I forget. There was a, uh, there was a monastic who, whose elder he greatly revered and uh, greatly helped his soul. And then he was reading in the early fathers. I think it was in St. Barsanufius and John, I forget. I think it was in St. Barsanufius and John. Even if you should see your elder committing fornication with your own eyes. Don't believe it. What? You thought that sounds a little bit not, not proper, not right? I mean, isn't your first thought, that's, that's a cult statement. That's a cultic, a cultish attitude. So he was thinking about this and thinking about this and thinking about this. Is that right? How can that be? So we thought he would go to, to ask his elder. It was late. It was not the usual hour that he went to, to, uh, to his elder, who had a little, you know, little, little dwelling, a little isba or something, a little cabin, cabin. Um, there in the grounds. Well, he went to him, and uh, but it, it was it was it was already dark. It was winter. It was already dark. But he froze because he saw, as he was approaching, there was an, a dark figure approaching from the side. There's like like a shawl, a shroud over their face. It was a woman, after hours, and she. 
and she kind of briefly lifted up the, the shawl from the, the, the cloth from her face, looked around, like I'm sure nobody could see her. And she went up to the to the elder's door. She knocked on the door. The door opened just a little bit and she went right inside. The disciple is horrified. <clears throat> He wanted it slightly. What's happening? He waited and he waited and waited and waited. About an hour later, the door opens a little bit. She comes right out, looks both ways. She goes off into the into the night, into the dark. He's thinking, what have I just this can't this can't be. And so he, he took note of the time. And uh, the next night he was there at the same time would it happen again. She appeared again. And just like before, knocked on the door, looking around. Most, most of the time the shrub is over, facing just a dark figure. The door opens a little bit, she goes inside. She's there for about an hour. She comes out, she leaves. He saw it happen three, four times, he says, I know what's going on here. So he went to confront his elder about this. <clears throat> he confronted his elder about what he was doing with this woman. Uh, it was obvious, but the elder said, my child, I, I don't know, I don't know what you're saying, I don't know. What, what, you say that you saw, you know, this, oh yes I did, not just once, every night. So the elder prayed and he says, hmm, let us both find out what is happening. He said, uh, he said, so tomorrow night, I'll, I, I won't be in my cell, I'll come out to where you are. We'll both be waiting. We'll both watch together. We'll pray. We'll pray together. And then they're both waiting at the hour. The, the dark lady, the lady in shroud, shrouded, comes, looks, knocks. The door opens of its own. She goes inside, there for about an hour, comes out. So the elder says, my child, this is the evil one who is uh, doing this. So he says, uh, I, I forget exactly how the vision, the, 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 uh, the apparition stopped, uh, the, the, the demon stopped visiting the cell. I think they said prayers or something and the abbot was informed. Anyway, um, they, said, they said prayers of exorcism. Then the, 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 the figure never came back. But he did learn the meaning of what was written by the Holy Fathers. Here's another problem with judging. Um, I mean, if we could judge accurately, well, maybe it would be a little better, but, uh, but we don't have all the information. Only God has all the information. For example, somebody is committing clearly a, a sinful, doing sinful things. And then, uh, and then you judge them. You look down upon them or think that they're a, a damned soul, that they have no chance for salvation or whatever it may be, or they're just a... Um, well, there are people that are bad people, and they're, 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 they're very simple, and they're, you know, they're, they're mass murderers, and there are people that um, debase currency and do very wicked things. And um, the thing is, the moment you judge them, what happens is if in the interval between the time that you saw them commit the sin and that you judge them, decide that they are a wicked person. What if they repented in that interval? Because great sinners have repented. Murderers have repented. Rapists have repented. Um, 
What if by the time, what, what if you're still judging them, but God has already forgiven them? What if they've already left their sin, like Mary of Egypt or whoever? Or the good thief on the cross? Then what? But you're still judging them because you don't have all the information. We see a lot of things that are very uh, disturbing in the policies and church hierarchies and bishops and synods and patriarchs and <clears throat> priests. And However, uh, you know, if we would just pray for it, the people that we see bad things happening, but we, we, we're very we're very good at denouncing that that is completely wrong. It's it's good that you know so and so broke communion or that there's d d discipline or there should be discipline. There should be defrocked or this should be this isn't right. You know, but 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 do we spend as much time really praying for them? These people who have impossibly hard jobs. Uh, you know, do we really, are, are we really praying for them? Are we really loving them like Christ loves every sinner? Immeasurably. So, um, the life of St. Vitali, uh, this all goes back to St. Vitali. It shows us that we just, just really can't judge. Now, you know, so, uh, there are people that we have judged that we sometimes can repent for judging them and get to a better place. Uh, probably each of us have, has experienced this. Um, uh, at the risk of being very personal, I want to share with you um, a recent time when I was going over the, my, my, my prayer list of my commemorations for Post Comedia. And then I started with a sort of a spiritual um, sensitivity to, you know, we, we, we judge people even just the way they talk or the way that, you know, that either they're not serious enough, they're a little bit too, 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 too much levity, or too serious, you know, need to lighten up a little bit, a little bit too serious, or they're not strict enough, or they're too strict, or they're, you know, seem to be too moving too slow. Maybe not, maybe not getting enough done, or they're or they're just overactive, and they're you know, they're like a Martha. They're you know, we we just we're, we're judging, 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 judging. So anyway, my point is that I took my 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 uh, proscomedia list, and I started commemorating the names adding the words, whom I have judged. So, I'm saying, you know, our, even starting with the patriarch, you know, our patriarch, girl, whom I have judged. And our medva, whom I have judged. And then every name, and then I found, wow, every single name, I had to add the words, whom I have judged. Either that thing they didn't do right, or that thing they said they would forgot, or the thing that they or they were a little bit too much, a little bit too much like this, a little bit too much like this, a little bit. Oh my goodness! I just I I, I don't know about you, but I, I I wound up. I could hardly go on because every single name of the people that I knew personally or, or had heard something about. Yes. Father, is there a way to describe? Um, kind of what comes upon uh, saints uh, like St. Vitale, uh, not just what comes upon him, for example, or other saints that have done similar um, kind of missions, uh, but also the people around them, like what, what could have sparked the patriarch to know that this is a, a godly mission and, and the women to, to the people who thought it was a scandal to change, you know, change their minds. Is there any way to describe that, or is it just well, com compared to our vision of reality that we will enjoy in the next life, everything in this life is a little bit um, uh, hard to discern and kind of dark and unclear to our understanding. 
So uh, all we have is the information that we have from our senses, hearing things from people, reading things about people. Mm, that's that's what else what else can we gather for information? But still in this life, the closer you are to God, the nearer your soul is in communion with God, the more God explains to us how things are. The most well-spoken person that you think, oh, that sounds good, that sounds correct. Be a little, little voice in you, though, says, mm, something's, something's off, something's wrong. And uh, even saints can be mistaken in these, in these matters. Uh, St. John was one of those who was in, enlightened by the Holy Spirit. He knew in the Holy Spirit um, that, uh, that Vitali was not, uh, was not committing great sins. He didn't know how, but he just somehow knew. Um, but I think all of us has at some point experienced some kind of an, uh, uh, insight or, or something that... Uh, Things sort of indicate uh, one assessment, but, but then uh, something inside of us says there's there's more to the story. Hold off. 